talent given by God, Neville Goddard Lecture, May 31, 1971. Get ready for an enlightening journey as we delve into the depths of our connection with the divine. In this video, we will explore the powerful truth about the talent we all possess, a gift bestowed by God but often overlooked by many. We will unravel the wise words from the book of Acts, going beyond and discovering the intimate relationship between God and man, revealing that there is no distance, only unity. We will unveil the mystery of how our imagination is the very essence of God. Just imagine, the same power that created and sustains the entire universe is within you. This divine spark, your imagination, is the key to a transformative reality. Understanding the grandeur of your interconnectedness with the Creator, we will see how we can shape our lives and reach unimaginable levels of potential. I highly recommend watching the video until the end to better grasp the content. Subscribe to our channel and keep receiving transformative content like this. Share your experiences and reflections with us in the comments below. Together, let's enrich this discussion and transform our lives. Now, let's get into the content. Tonight, the law informs us in the book of Acts that God is not far from each of us, for in him we live, move, and exist, Acts 17 verse 28. I'd like to tweak this a bit and tell you that God is never so far as to be near, for closeness implies separation, and God and man are one. Man is all imagination, and God is man, existing in us and us in him. In the words of William Blake, the eternal body of man is the imagination, and that is God. Therefore, he cannot even be near because proximity implies separation. At this level, you and I can go mad, mad, exercising the same power that created the universe and sustains our wonderful human imagination, which is God. In him, all things were made, and without him, nothing that was made was made, John 3, whether good, bad, or indifferent. Tonight, let me share with you some experiences to illustrate that everything is your wonderful human imagination. You may have read the Los Angeles Times last Saturday on the front page, where the story of a plane was featured. This story was told and broadcast on TV and gained popularity. Sir Lem tells how a man was influenced to take this story and use it to his advantage. He threatened the Australian airline with 107 passengers on board, claiming that he would explode the plane at a specific airport if they didn't pay $560,000. What did they do? They paid him this extortion of $560,000 based on an imaginary plot. Upon realizing what he had done, Robbie Ealing asked the producers to withdraw the film from TV and not air it anymore. They refused because it was created for profit and will continue to be shown for profit, regardless of how many airports or countless people may suffer from it. I didn't see in his remorse that he would give his income from the proceeds to anyone to reimburse the $560,000. No, he didn't say he would pay it back, he now earns it at the Australian airport. He will keep and write a lot more nonsense because he doesn't know what you know. Imagination creates reality because God's imagination creates, and God is man. Therefore, man's imagination creates, and there is no separation between God and man, we are one. God became like us so that we might become like him, as William Blake beautifully expressed, there is no natural religion. Allow yourself at this level to make all the mistakes in the world, go mad, and imagine anything foolish in the world. Now let me share with you some stories from William Butler Yeats. You can find them in his volume titled The Trembling of the Veil, which emerged at the turn of the century. It is part of his collective works, but this individual volume was printed, I believe, three or four times. This is the chapter he called Magic. He recounted, I was on vacation in Paris and woke up early, thinking of going out to get the morning paper before my host woke up. I entered and saw the little maid setting the table for breakfast. I told myself one of those long, stupid stories that one tells only to oneself, if something that didn't happen could happen, I would have hurt my arm. So, I imagined myself with my arm in a sling, imagining it so completely that I projected my imaginative act onto that sensitive child the little girl who was just setting the breakfast table. When I returned with my newspaper, my host greeted me at the door, and she was all nervous, asking about my arm, as she said the little maid had told her that my arm was in a sling. Then I remembered what I had done, 
I simply imagine that if I had done what I didn't do, I would have hurt my arm, and my arm would now be in a sling. So, I projected my imaginative act so intensely onto that maid that she saw it as a real fact. He continued, almost simultaneously, I thought intensely of a fellow student, a message I wanted to convey to him but didn't want it written on paper, I wanted to tell him, but he wasn't present. Two days later, I received a letter from that fellow student, who was several hundred miles away, right at the moment when I thought intensely about him and the message. I appeared, seemingly in bodily form, as if I were in flesh, in a large hotel where he was amid a large crowd of people. He told me he would like me to come back later after the crowd dispersed. So, I disappeared, returned at midnight, and told him the message, which he later confirmed in his letter. Now, he said, I may tell countless stories about the power of imagination. He then recounted the story of Joseph Blanco, a popular and supposedly very true story of a student at the University of Oxford. Blanco found himself without money and unable to continue his studies. On the day he left the college due to a lack of funds, he couldn't find employment and joined a group of gypsies. One day, two students who knew him from college found him among the gypsies. He signaled not to be identified and later approached them, saying, I will meet you at the inn, and then I will explain why you find me in the middle of this crowd. Well, they became curious and went to the inn. When he entered the inn, he told them that they are not exactly the vagabonds people think they are. They have a secret unknown in Oxford, none of our professors knows about it. I know I never heard of it, he said. So, no one knows, but I will tell you what they taught me. I've learned everything they taught me so far and improved. Now, to show what I mean by this, I'll leave you two alone, and when I come back, I'll tell you what you discussed in my absence. When he returned, he detailed what they had discussed, everything they had talked about. They were curious and wondered why. He said, you had no choice in the matter, I determined what you would discuss. My imagination led yours. Their story is all about imagination, and they, through complete control of their own imagination, influence their behavior. That's what I learned from them. Well, if God does all things, then God must be human imagination. If a man can control his imagination in such a way that it influences his behavior, and you think you initiate what you do, when it was the man in control of his imagination who did it, then we understand what the poet meant, all things by a divine law and one another's being mingle. As Shelley in the philosophy of love says, I see you. Understand if we were not mixed, I could not perceive you. If I could not penetrate your brain, and you could not penetrate mine, you would not see me. So, all things by a divine law and one another's being mingle. Imagination is that non-objective reality from which all objects spring, just like sudden fancy. Everything in the world comes from the wonderful human imagination because that is God, and there is no other God. I know, in my own case, sitting in New York City in my apartment with the desire to comfort my sister 3,000 kilometers away across the water, just lying on my bed, leaving the room, I went to my bedroom, closed the door, and asked my wife not to disturb me. In that interval, Prazunik was in Barbados, and in the bed where her son was dying of cancer, there was no hope of recovery. He was deprived at the age of 17 with cancer, and to comfort her, I assumed it was her son and truly felt he was there. I imagined seeing my sister coming through the door, and she saw her brother Levi instead of her son Bill. She approached and looked at me. I then woke up in New York eight days later. This was before we had airmail, it came by slow freight. So, eight days later, I received a letter from my sister Daphne. She said, Neville, I don't understand, and she dated the letter on the day I did what I just told you. She said, I went to the room to see Billy. When I entered the room, it was you I came, looked at what should have been Billy, and I'm looking at you. I rubbed my eyes, did everything to bring normal vision, but I couldn't see my son Bill. I am only seeing my brother Neville, and I can't understand. Now, she began to feel through the superstitions of the world because Bill was dying of cancer, that the next to die would be her brother Neville. That's how she interpreted it. She didn't know what I was doing in New York, but what I did didn't help. He died, 
He died of cancer, but I managed to project myself 2,000 miles away into a bed I knew so well, my father's room. It was my father and mother's room, and I knew that was where Billy was sleeping. So, I assumed I was in that bed, actually in Billy's place, so that when my sister saw me, she would be encouraged to have faith and hope. However, she was so disturbed because, no matter what she did, rubbing her eyes, closing them, opening them, closing them, opening them, she still saw Neville. She couldn't see her son. Now, when you hear these stories from those who are not lying to you, you may not understand, and reason will deny. But if you have an experience, even if reason denies it, you cannot deny the experience. My sister could not deny what she truly experienced, and I could not deny what I did because, when I went out that night to the living room, a friend called during the cocktail hour and said, Neville, you always seem so light and cheerful. But tonight, you seem so heavy-spirited. So, I told her what I had just done. Well, eight days later, when the letter arrived, I handed it to that same woman who was at home again during the cocktail hour and showed her what my sister had written. So here, my wife and my friend were witnesses to what I had told them eight days in advance that I had done. Then came the letter from my sister, asking for some explanation about it. So, I tell you, from experience, that imagination creates reality. At this level, we are just learning, we are all students, simply in kindergarten. We go crazy, as Howells did, because he made a fortune writing this story, and it is still being shown on TV. He will still receive his royalties, invest them in some IBM or some other stock. He did not deliver, he will write more nonsense because everything is nonsense. But he doesn't realize what he is accumulating for himself. So, let no one think they are getting away with something. Misuse your talent, and you will reap unpleasant rewards. Today in dollars and cents, tomorrow, you will reap another kind of payment. Tomorrow, dollars and cents cannot buy you out dollars and cents also cannot free you from it. You will go through the experience of having misused a talent you received. Talent is a gift from God himself. God truly became man so that man may become God. Therefore, this is the law by which we live. Learn to use your imagination with love in the name of everyone in this world because you will reap the fruit of it, whether you use it with love or without love. You will reap the fruit of it. So, I say to you tonight, God is not separate from man, he never is, not in eternity. He is so far that he becomes near because proximity implies separation. This statement from chapter 17 of Acts would imply separation. He is not even separated, he cannot even be near you because he is your own self. When you say I, that is God. When you say I am, that is God. I am as his name forever and ever. There is no other God. The moment you say thou, that is a false god. If you address him as you, that is a false god. The only god is I am, that is my name forever and by that name, you are known for all generations, Exodus 3 verse 15. So, do not abuse it. Now you can set any goal, any objective, and if you really know exactly how things would be if you had achieved it and then enter that state, I can tell you, it will become an objective for you. At the moment, it appears just a shadow, merely a shadow because you haven't entered the outline. When you step into the outline, the sketch takes on a cubic reality and becomes an objective for you, not for another, but for you. Now, leave it alone, in time, it will flourish and become what the world calls objective reality. It was real the exact moment you entered because you were the reality. All things exist in the human imagination, but all things, you name it, exist in you. However, in you, it exists only as a shadow. It is dim, but if you step into the so-called shadow, clothe yourself with it, at this moment, your familiar home is just a shadow, and this room, which you don't know well, seems so real because you are in it. Everything in this so-called world is a natural effect, and every natural effect has a vaginal cause, not a natural one. A natural cause only appears, it's an illusion of the fading memory. As Blake said, Milton, our memory is good, it is suitable for sameness but not perfect. I'll demonstrate when you go home tonight. Take a common magazine, pick the cover, a landscape, or a postcard. Look at it and know exactly what you're doing. You're looking at the postcard, 
try to memorize it. Spend as much time as you want on it, take an hour if you like. Try to memorize that card, and you think you know it. Fine, you know it. Now, turn it over and try to reconstruct it from your memory. Be honest with yourself and see how far you are from what you were observing. However, when you hear your memory say, it's good enough for sameness, you know it's the same card because it's good enough. But it's not good enough for a posterior image. So, our memory is good enough for sameness, that's why a man doesn't remember what he imagined. He forgets what he imagined when it comes into motion when he confronts his harvest, he denies having anything to do with it. He can't remember what he did. Now, every imaginative man in this world is always casting, I would say, glamour, influencing everyone else who is passive and lacks imagination. They are always falling under the influence of those who are vivid in their imagination, they are reaping. You'll understand the cry on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because some imagination compelled them to act as they did. So forgive them, the actors are only the instruments. Any condemnation goes to the author, not the actor. When a man condemns the actor in the drama, in reality, if there is any condemnation, it belongs to the author, not the actor. The author of the play is God because God is his own wonderful human imagination. This man extorted $560,000 from Qantas. He conceived it, he saw it on TV, and it gave him an idea. He thought, maybe I can get away with this. Well, who was the author of it? Robert, he conceived it. And here was an actor who thought, here's an idea to get half a million dollars, and he succeeded because there were 107 souls aboard that plane, and they couldn't take the risk of it not being true. At a certain altitude, it would explode. So, they would have to pay those extortionate $560,000 and save the lives of the 107 souls on board that plane. Then he got the money, and he was the actor. If they catch him, undoubtedly, they'll condemn him to life imprisonment. But who is the real guilty one? He who wrote it. So, he is making all kinds of money with that scene he wrote, and he continues to do so. He wrote a series that lasted two or three years in prime time and is still selling. In other times, everything outside of his marvelous imagination was called forth. What he did with that, however, harmed no one. He made a fortune using his talent, but in that, he misused his talent, and his repentance does not alter the fact. Yet, he pays for it in a way that money will never be able to compensate. That is the story, and if repentance doesn't alter the fact, in the end, no one escapes the misuse of this talent without consequences. He pays for it in a way that money will never be able to compensate. This is the story. Thus, his own marvelous human imagination is God, and this God is creating all the phenomena in the world. As Neville said, man is not a creature of circumstances, circumstances are creatures of men. We are creating, we are not victims of circumstances. The man is not a creature of circumstances, circumstances are creatures of men. As Benjamin Disraeli wisely noted, here was a man, a capable man, who said, Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. He never denied that he was a Jew. His own name says who he is, Benjamin, son of Israel. He never denied that he was an Israelite. But he knew that true Christianity, well understood, was just the blossom, the fruit on the tree of Israel. It was the fulfillment of it when God truly became man, became incarnate in man, and every now and then, his marvelous human imagination, which is God, awakens in a man, and he knows he is God. He tries to tell his world, and they deny it. That's not what they're looking for. When it was buried in every man, in every man it should awaken. When it awakens, he is God. But before it awakens, oh, he goes mad. He makes mistakes, these horrible mistakes in the world. But the day will come when he will awaken completely within man. When he does, he will be ruled by love and nothing but love until we are completely ruled by the love of the horrors we create in this world. So, every vast objective world is created by the acts and imaginations of man, all now proven in the world, was once only imagined. I don't care how simple a thing is, a chair, the dress you wear, the hat, the house, everything was only imagined and then executed. 
it all started in the imagination of man. So, everything in this world is nothing more than acts and imaginations of expelled men, whether good, bad, or indifferent. So tonight, take me seriously, and know that you and you alone are responsible for the phenomena in your world. If you are passive and not alert, you can be influenced because all things by a divine law are one of each other and mixed together. But still, it's the only being, so you can be influenced. You and I, I believe, are beyond taking staged photos shown on TV and extorting half a million dollars. I believe your ethical code is beyond that. But not everyone is beyond that. You and I, hopefully, are beyond these things. Yet, countless people who are not beyond that will be simply influenced by the powerful imagination of a writer, a very successful writer. If tonight he were invited by some university to talk about the art of writing, he could demand perhaps $2,000 or $3,000 for his appearance, and he knows nothing about the story of the Bible. But it doesn't matter, if he knew, he wouldn't have done it. So, you know this, and he doesn't. Then he earns his $3,000, if he wants to take it, he doesn't have to accept it. He has so much money that he doesn't need it. But you have what he doesn't have, you have awakened to the point of knowing how to use your imagination lovingly for others. Therefore, this is the law of scripture. When we speak of the law of the promise, this is the law that your imaginative acts are creating facts in the world. Imagination creates reality. Carefully observe what you are imagining when you return home tonight, about to sleep. See if your mind is filled with lovely, imaginary things, and fall into that state. Don't let the sun set on your anger, indeed, resolve it within yourself and sleep as if things were as you would like them to be or have made them lovely and wonderful in your world. I say this for your own good because in the not-so-distant future, not only the small crowd here, but the entire vast world will have departed. Those who now claim to be of another generation and demand special service will, in the not-so-distant future, be old, having vanished from this world. It's time for all of us to wake up, to understand what is truly causing the phenomena of the world. The phenomena of the world are caused by the acts and imaginations of men. So take this seriously and don't let a day end without reviewing and changing the acts and imaginations of the day. Do it according to your dream, your ideal, and live in it as if it were true. I'm telling you from personal experience, there will come a day when you will sit and think of something that is not present. The world calls it imagination. If you see something that is present, they call it perceived sense, this is real. If you think of something that is not present, they call it imagination. But you will know how to enter what is not present to your senses, and your entry into it will give you a public reality. It will be as real as the room you are sitting in, it will become objective for you. The entire vast world is like this, but it will be transcended by the being that will be awakened within you, for that being that awakens within you is God himself, lowered to the human mind. And when he awakens, he is God in intensity, and there is nothing absent, for he is omnipresent. So he sees everything from where he is. He does not think, for he is omnipresent. Being omnipresent, he sees all beings as they are, and they are not what they appear to be externally to the world of the senses. They are what they are in the heart. He sees exactly what they are thinking, feeling, plotting, planning. He sees all intentions of the heart. When someone says, why did this happen to him and not to that one, when he is so prominent in the world? Look at what he did. He built a hospital, adopted a child, gave a fortune. But God sees the heart. He doesn't see the fortune given to build the hospital or even to adopt. He sees what no one on the surface sees, he sees the motive behind the gift. He sees everything behind everything, for he is omnipresent. He sees everything as it is. When you are informed, I called them all before me and said, no, I reject. That is for choosing that one called David. He rejected his brothers because, as the saying goes, man judges by appearances but God sees only the heart. So, I reject, I reject, I reject. Call the other one. Samuel 16 7, then came David. Now there is a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Acts 13 verse 22, now you see, if you take seriously what is reserved for all of us, the end is God. The origin of everything is God. 
In the interval, we become furious, we run madly. But if you know what you can do, start doing it. Don't wait. You can be the man, you can be the woman you want to be. But wishing won't do, you must be it. You can't just say, I wish to be it. You must assume that you are it and sleep in the assumption that you are it. This assumption, though denied by your senses and denied by everything around you, if persisted in, will become a fact. So dare to assume that you are the man, the woman you want to be, and day after day live in that assumption as if it were true. This assumption will become a reality in the world, even if you go hungry, no matter what happens. Persist in the assumption. And this assumption will objectify and become a reality in your world. Don't let anything small be forgotten. I can't tell you how moved I am when I receive your letters, where in your dreams, you are teaching the law of imagination. Someone in your dream has a discussion, let's say, with a priest, a rabbi, or a minister, and you are instructing them and telling them about it. Now, a dream is egocentric, it's yourself pushed out. But here you are, actually taking the symbols of authority, simply lowering them to a certain level where it's no longer their authority, you are instructing and telling them that it is yourself made visible, revealing what you have discovered about the cause of the phenomena of life. When you have these dreams and share them with me, say it as you do. I can't tell you my excitement. Everyone will one day awaken, and when they awaken, they awaken in a single place where God is already awake. He awakens in the skull of man, in the skull. And when he awakens, he comes out of that skull, and it is God who is born, born from above. Then he goes through the normal series of time and reaches that point where he becomes, well, mature. He reaches the age of spiritual puberty. Then the earthly father disappears because when he reaches the age of 12, Joseph disappears from the scene, and he is now the creator. He can actually create his own image. He creates because he has reached the age of spiritual puberty. So, the earthly father ceases to be part of the play when the boy in time reaches the age of 12. But he has foreshadowed it before, and after about 12, not exactly 12, when he was about 12 years old, they sought him and wondered why he did this to them. And he said, Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? And he was talking to his father and mother, and they did not understand. Luke 2 verses 49 to 50, So, Joseph disappears from the play. He is no longer brought back into the game because he has become the father. Thus, the son makes his father, he now creates like God the father. Tonight, I want it to be just at this level, the level of good law, where a man, if in control of his own imagination, is in control of the phenomena of his life. He is not a victim of circumstances, circumstances are creatures of his own creation. He creates if he knows what he is doing. If he doesn't know what he is doing and is passive in this world, he can be influenced by the imagination of one who is in control of his imagination. Because he doesn't know what he's doing, he is as being. He didn't know. If he knew, he wouldn't have done it. And to this day, he doesn't know. He only regrets what he did but doesn't know that his imagination is creating reality. He sees the evidence before him and still doesn't know. I tell you, imagination creates reality. So, be careful what you imagine because you are setting it in motion. Because all things, by a divine law, are mixed up in one another. You are influencing everyone, even if they don't see your picture or read your book. As Yates said again, having seen the operation of this law, we should never be certain that it was not a woman treading the winepress that started this subtle change in the minds of men. Or that the passion for which so many countries were given over to the sword did not begin in the mind of some shepherd boy, lighting up his eyes for a moment before going his way. Who knows who tonight feels neglected, feels hurt, feels unjustly accused, and who is sitting alone, treading the winepress? Who tomorrow will influence some catastrophe, some shepherd boy dreaming of a heroic future and thinking only in terms of war that could bring him the crown of a hero? While taking care of his sheep, he is simply dreaming of being a hero and using his talent, which is God, using his imagination in some destructive way, although he cares for the sheep. So, I say to everyone, know what you are doing at every moment because your imagination is creating reality. Now, let us enter into silence.